when you think of crypto oasis i don't necessarily want you to think of slick it crypto oasis think of it as you would think of silicon valley crypto valley uh, the silk route it's a geographic location we reached that milestone of first a thousand companies then a thousand five hundred companies and then you know the recently published report refers to a thousand eight hundred companies in this space chain data suggests that the middle east and north africa region the remit of crypto oasis right is the fastest growing in the world growing 1.5x from last year i can see a world where slowly but surely we will move towards a more decentralized centralized architecture i want to welcome you to the second season of couchonomics with arjun join us this season as we go beyond fintech and payments and embark on the journey into the future of financial services a future which will be shaped by existing and new developments in technology and innovation including and not limited to the likes of embedded finance open banking ESG various versions of metaverse decentralized finance digital currencies and other trends on the couch we're going to have the most influential and progressive minded founders executives investors regulators innovators and industry commentators from across the mena region and beyond join us as we unravel a multitude of layers of the financial services industry and try to learn how technology will continue to impact the world that we live in couchonomics with arjun is proud to collaborate with some of the most respected and innovative names in the world of payments fintech and technology audian is a reliable end to end payment solution that provides innovation and flexibility to help businesses achieve their ambition faster by turning payments into a strategic growth driver get everything you need with to you a saudi based super app for delivery, mobility, on-demand services and a lot more. Tu you connects you to everything you need to enrich your daily lives by building an ecosystem across its end consumers, merchants and reps. Visa is a world leader in digital payments with a mission to connect the world through the most innovative, convenient, reliable and secure payments network to enable individuals, businesses and economies to thrive. Jidia is a leading fintech and payment solution provider founded in Saudi Arabia, expanding rapidly across the region with established operations in UAE and Egypt. Jidia's vision is to empower merchants with the tools to start, manage and grow their business. M2P pioneers next-gen fintech through innovative offerings across payments, lending and banking landscapes. The comprehensive tech stack powers end-to-end -end banking services bnpl customized credit cards prepaid cards and more welcome to today's episode of couchonomics with arjun i'm your host arjun and joining me today on the couch is the co-founder of crypto oasis Uh, his name is Sakar Erekat, and I got that correct because we were worried about me getting the the surname correct uh, or the family name correct. Sakar, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. Or I should actually say, welcome to the couch. Well, yeah, it's 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 a beautiful couch, right? I love the entire environment. So thank you for having me. Oh, pleasure, pleasure. We have not known each other for a long time, which is quite surprising because I think uh, we have been uh, in the same sort of environment or, right. or the sector, the segment. I think I met you, but maybe three or four months back. Yeah. Right. Uh, and was that the DIFC roundtable thing? It was yeah. at the DIFC yeah. roundtable, and then you were very kind enough to uh, invite me across to your event, which was at Caesar Palace. uh which to be honest with you and I'm not saying that because I'm on my show was was way more impressive than I had imagined I'm glad to hear right that. I I walked in there as a as a skeptical individual saying <laughs> not sure what to expect and I think I was pretty much the last person to leave the event <laughs> uh which tells you both about me as the personality <laughs> and the quality of the event but no uh jokes aside I think what was very very I think there there are three takeaways for me there one was I think it, it was uh it, it, there was genuine vibrance right yeah. uh in the in the environment uh i i met uh, quite a few very interesting people uh who were in my opinion very enlightening to myself uh, right. i guess i'm on the 
early curve of what you guys refer to as as Web3, uh, mm-hmm. I'm, as I'm a student. Mm-hmm. Uh, and thirdly is that I actually uh, have been able to build quite a few relationships on the back of that. Nice. Um, and some of them might actually turn into something more substantial. So, well, thanks for having me there. Um, um, it's an absolute pleasure. And listening to that feedback, that's exactly why we have these events and we celebrate the ecosystem and the diversity of it. And so, so that drives me right to the question, right? So, so Crypto OS is, is um, I guess, an ecosystem facilitator, creator. I'll, I'll let you use right. the word. Talk to us uh, and, and, I guess, talk to my audience because I'm not quite sure how many of my audience are familiar with crypto oases and walk us through the journey of you know the genesis of where it came from mm-hmm. you know what have been sort of the important milestones that you guys have achieved and what's what's sort of ahead of you in the foreseeable future all right perfect so when you think of crypto oases i don't necessarily want you to think of slick it crypto oases think of it as you would think of silicon valley crypto valley uh, the silk route it's a geographic location Right, and this really started. Um, well, it had multiple starting points, but at some point in 2021, it was just a perfect storm. Right, um, on one side, I was blessed enough to be in the room when blockchain was proposed to the UAE government at the time, the government of the, of Dubai to be specific, and we defined at the time the first blockchain strategy in the world. Mm-hmm. Right, for government. Right, because everyone was talking about crypto. On the other side, um, one of my partners was was building out what is today known as the Crypto Valley, right? Okay. And was one of the founding members of the Crypto Valley. In 2020, then, um, we signed an agreement at the World Economic Forum with the Dubai Multi Commodities Center to set up the Crypto Center, the DMCC Crypto Center, mm-hmm. right? And throughout that entire time, we, s- we were hoping and praying for all intents and purposes, and we had the vision that this space is going to be unique. And this is why we wanted to give it its own name, Mm -hmm. right? Rather than the Silicon Valley of the Middle East or the Crypto Valley of the Middle East, it's the Crypto Oasis. And the Crypto Oasis is Middle East and North Africa, um, which I'm very happy to say, you know, two years ago, this was a a good idea, but today we can actually go out and prove with on-chain data that this is the fastest growing region in the world when it comes to crypto activity, right? When we look at milestones, it's um, we opened our doors. Uh, it was uh, in the beginning of uh, of twenty one, um, hoping to have I think um, it was five hundred companies at the end of the year. And uh, I was already worried at the time because although we defined in the strategy that it would be. In, which was a couple of years ago in 2016 it was published by his highness um that there would be a thousand companies when when we put that when we put that original goal to have 500 and then a thousand companies in the ecosystem like where are these companies going to come from but believe it or not uh, it was i think it was the next world economic forum where we were um there to to announce our 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 milestones where we said that there's already a thousand companies, and and what's really impressive is not, and today it's a thousand eight hundred companies, right? Talking about the, the explosive growth of this entire space, that vibe you're talking about that you felt at the at the ecosystem night, a lot of people that are from these more advanced geographies, let's put it this way, from a startup ecosystem point of view, like from Silicon Valley, um, like from Crypto Valley, they say this is exactly what it felt like at the time. This was the buzz that we felt and this is the buzz that is here right now so i've got a couple of questions yeah. right so before you go further on the milestones yeah. right so 1800 companies are part of the the crypto oasis ecosystem yeah is there talk to us a little bit about uh and let me try and break this down into yeah. three types of questions where are the vast majority of these companies coming from yeah. right so where are these founders coming from homegrown versus uh uh, uh i guess uh, overseas and overseas which particular part mm-hmm. secondly uh, uh the the whole space uh, of crypto or digital assets or you know whatever we want to refer it to as is quite a wide sort of segment. There's a lot which sits yeah. under this sort of Web three. Is there a, a particular area where you, you're seeing more traction? And thirdly, which I think is the most important question, is how many of them are what I call close to money? Right. Right. 
Um, the third question is the most difficult to answer. <laughs> yeah, and, but I, just give us a flavor, right? I'm yeah. not asking for any definitive percentages. Let's, let's try and break this yeah. down, right? So first things first. When we say 1,800 companies, we're counting all companies active in the space. Okay. We make a, a distinct differentiation between a native organization and a non-native organization. Okay. What's a native organization? A native organization has crypto, blockchain, NFTs, Web3s, whatever you call it, at its core. It exists because of this technology. Right, And non-native, think of the large tech players that are all active in this space. But if blockchain shuts down tomorrow, right, they would still be alive. Okay. What's impressive is to see that more than, more than 65, 70% of the space is native, native. organizations. Right. Okay. Right? And that is the first time we ran these numbers because we, you know, we did all the hard work. We went through the news announcements. We went through the public registries. Honestly, we were surprised. Mm-hmm. It talks to a really nascent space that is actually building and adopting the space from the ground up. Now, given you are in Dubai and Dubai enjoys a migration from everywhere around the world, it's very difficult to point towards, is it, let's say, the North Americans or is it the Asians or is it the Europeans or is it the Africans? But it's everyone, right? And companies, the majority of companies are incepted over here. Yes, maybe they have a let's say a token issuance entity somewhere somewhere around the world because you can't actually do that here as of right now. Um, but essentially, it is companies from all around. The, the diversity of Dubai is reflected in the countries, uh, in the companies that we see in those 1,800 uh, companies. And so, so, so again, going back into it, I think we're at a very early stage of we getting are. regulations, policies, compliance yeah. around it. So, so what's driving this attractiveness to... I guess, uh, should I say Dubai rather than UAE? It is the UAE. Okay. Right. And today um, more, I mean, Dubai took a leading role in 2016. But and then, largely uh, that was catalyzed by the fact that the government decided that they wanted to do something for themselves. Correct. And with that, this is also in line with what the government here does. Right. The government was one of the first governments in the region to adopt e-services, mm -hmm. you know, one of the first governments in the region to adopt mobile services, mm -hmm. one of the first governments in the region to allow you to do stuff while you're sitting at home, mm -hmm. one of the first governments in the region to integrate a unique ID for all of the uh, the citizens, right? The first countries in the region to allow you to do 100% foreign direct ownership. So they are really on that, that leading edge. I really don't just say that because we are in the UAE. I think we're very blessed to be in the UAE and to, to live under this leadership that says, you know what? At the end of every year, and I'm sure you know that, government entities are scored towards their innovation activities. And you have, you know, these innovation months where these government entities are being pushed towards adopting new ways of working, new technologies, right? So there's a little bit of a, there's a, little bit of a trend here, right? The, U, the Dubai government in 2016 became one of the first governments in the world to say we will put blockchain on our government agenda. Right, and at the time, no other government had done such a strategic effort on such a wide scale. Right? So let me ask you a question. Yeah. Naive question, but educate me. Should I split blockchain and crypto? Because for me, blockchain is technology. I think it is. Yeah. It it is a very useful technology. I've been reading up on it for the last couple of years. Obviously, it's developing as we talk, right? I see number of use cases, yeah. including even in the sector that I mostly operate, which is financial services. Crypto takes us into the world of altcoins and right. stable coins and all kinds of names, and there's thousands of these out yeah. there. Should we be separating the two? I don't think you can separate the two as such. Okay. One should understand that if blockchain is this entire room, then crypto is this table. Okay. Right? Um, I think the, the easiest way I learned to describe it uh, throughout the years is think of blockchain as concrete. Yep. Right? With concrete, you can build a wall, you can build a hospital, you can build a hotel, you can build a house, you can build a bunker. Right? It's the building block. It's a base building block. But then... Each time you adopt it or you apply it, it's applied a little bit differently. And there's different flavors to it. Think of blockchains as the way we describe cars. There's sports cars, there's carburelays, there's SUVs, there's cars with three, uh, three, uh, three wheels, there's cars with six wheels, you know, 
right? So it's a it's a overarching term, right? Then blockchains come in different flavor. The first use case, though, and we can't forget that, it's was Bitcoin. Bitcoin, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. This entire technology, right, derived from Bitcoin. And yeah, and it Bitcoin was, is a and cryptocurrency. For, and for a while, it, you could not split the two. No. It, Until know. now. I mean, come on. We're <laughs> in 2023. And we still need to ensure that we, we, we allow people to understand that. So the poster, chi- the poster child for bit blockchain was Bitcoin. Once we started talking on an enterprise level and a government level, then no change. one wanted to hear about Bitcoin because Bitcoin was illicit transactions, Bitcoin was money laundering, Bitcoin was the stuff that, you know, the dark people, web. The dark web. There you go, right? And we had to always make the distinction, don't think of Bitcoin, yeah. right? But I think it's 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 unfair to say it's that. Hard to- the, the original use cases. I have lots of questions. So, sure, no, sorry, let's ahead. revert go back ahead. to your milestones. Right. right. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> we, 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 this is the pro- problem with these conversations, right? <laughs> and the problem with Arjun, actually. Like, we, we, we always go into these rabbit holes. Yeah. But so, come back We're to the milestones. We're just at the, at the distinction of UAE versus Dubai versus Rasul Khaim yeah. and others. So, this, I think, is, a, is just an important point I wanted to wrap yeah, up. Please. 16. Dubai came out, but 1880 GM became one of the first jurisdictions in the world to govern exchanges. Mm hmm. Right, and that's massive. And now today we look at it and we see every single emirate having some form of agenda point mm-hmm. towards the blockchain space. Yes. So while I live in Dubai, while a lot of my work was delivered in Dubai, I've lived in Abu Dhabi as well. I think it's very important to look at it as a UAE as a whole. And when we talk about crypto oasis, we mean the Middle East and North Africa region, right? And with that, we reached that milestone of first a thousand companies, then a thousand five hundred companies, and then you know the recently published report refers to a thousand. 800 companies in this space right that are that are active working how many of them are close to money you know it's it was a difficult time in the past i think 2022 was probably one of the worst years with all of the things that happened so you know we had uh, mount gox and 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 hacks and everything in one right the large the second largest exchange in the world collided the largest financial institutions in the space collided um or, you know, imploded yep. for all intents and purposes, not collided. Um, and you know what? We're still here. Right? No, you guys are still here. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, the space is still here. Yeah. What, what happened is enough to tear down an entire industry from a banking point of view, from a large company point of view, from startups. So a lot of people struggled. A lot of people... So what we saw also, it's not a... Um, while it's 1,800 companies, we saw a lot of companies also shut down, mm-hmm. right? But with that, more and more companies. More okay. and more companies so talk about the space. native ones for a little bit to me. Is there a particular direction out of those native companies? Because, you know, if you take the whole... Uh, and I'll use the term Web3 now to yeah. further confuse the topic, <laughs> right? Add another word into it. Uh, my humble opinion, I don't think Web3 is the point of arrival. Right. I think Web3 to me is a transition towards a more decentralized world in whatever capacity right. that could mean. Uh, because I, I personally think uh, I, uh, even if you were to get decentralized, there is some level of centralization at some level, yeah. right? Which has no, to This happen. becomes philosophical. This is yeah, not it's a technology. A, and, and it's a philosophical discussion. Yeah. So are your native companies... Uh, which if they're two thirds, as you mentioned, so let's say roughly a thousand yeah. to twelve hundred companies, exactly. right? Are they focused in some specific area of that sort of wider Web three uh, yeah. uh, sphere? Yeah. So a lot of them are traders and brokers, right? Right. Companies that essentially oh, um, want to make a quick buck. Sorry. <laughs> and that's it, right? It's it's very easy to get taken by all of this and just say, hey, let's make some quick money out of it. But, I mean, there's a reason why we say easy come and easy go, yeah. right? Um, DeFi is is gaining a lot of traction. Fair. And gaming locally is is on the rise. Yes. Right? And, I and the numbers, ref- numbers are just phenomenal. I refer to gaming as being the Trojan horse, yeah. right? I think gaming will be finally the place where all of this will come closer to users, where people will stop thinking about what blockchain are they using or what crypto are they using, and they'll just use it for the sake of being able to use it and being able to tap into a benefit of it, right? But we shouldn't forget about native blockchain, non-crypto um, use cases as well. So a lot of traceability use cases in healthcare particularly, right? Um, 
thinking about uh, food traceability. So today, you know, even here in the UAE, you can trace your food on blockchain in some of the outlets. Um, so it, it, wide scale, but yeah, I have to admit that the majority is traders and brokers. Yeah, but, but, but what, what I'm good, what, what I'm actually pleased to hear that there are people who are also building what I call sustainable solutions. Yes. Like the ones you've mentioned. And this is where I actually personally get quite excited about some of these technologies like blockchain, like NFTs, because, you know, I think a lot of the initial NFTs was about digital arts, whether they were monkeys, apes, whatever that's else right. they yeah. were, yeah. right? And that's yeah. fine. But I do think NFTs are incredibly powerful. And when companies like Starbucks, you know, start, you know, rebuilding or transitioning their their loyalty programs, which pretty much, you know, permeate society onto a, you know, a blockchain-based environment, start issuing NFTs, Nike spots up, uh, partners with uh, artifacts, starts right. doing things. Right. I personally can start seeing that, you know, NFTs are entering uh, into the world. And we will get into those topics, including tokenization, which is uh, my favorite sort of horse. Because I personally it's think fair, yeah. the yeah. power of tokenization is tremendous. And Huge. if it can be purely unleashed into the economy, yeah. it, it will, you know, uh, substantially uh, uh, impact the way it is. I want to hear a little bit more about what does crypto oasis do do or does. I, that's my favorite topic to talk okay. about, right? right? So we are ecosystem builders first, right? We're building this ecosystem actively with multiple different players. Um, based on that, we then have the ability to provide unique insights. So we were the first to issue a report of its kind about the creep, uh, crypto ecosystem. Um, with that, we have access to unique thought leadership that we publish in the space. We then have an advisory arm where we help people um, and large organizations or startups to enter into the space. Um, and then obviously what, what is really in our core is venture building. So we, um, we're very proud to be one of the first um, receivers of the license of the venture building studio license in the DIFC, which is a cutting edge first of its kind license that is nowhere available in the world. So, it, it, this, so this is a, so it's what's going to be called the Crypto Oasis Ventures. Venture Build Ventures. It's called Crypto Oasis Ventures. And then last but not least, we have an investment structure, multiple investment structures where we invest into the ecosystem. Right. And 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 so these this, so let's talk a little bit about this sure. venture building because yeah. this is a personal interest to me. Sure. So so this is going to be a venture builder run by Crypto Oasis, or are you uh are you some sort of a launch pad which will allow other venture builders to come and collaborate and build with you? I think that's the job of DIFC. So DIFC right. have done this wonderful exercise where they're putting a lot of venture builders together. Yes. We're focused on venture building in the Web3 space or in the crypto space okay. or in the blockchain space. By okay. the way, these, these terms, the reason why uh, people use them um, is because really... Very little of them have. Digital assets, we know what digital assets are, right? Digital assets are any form of representation of something physical or something of value in a digital, digital world. Form. By the way, digital assets don't necessarily need to be on blockchain they or don't. crypto, oh, right? Yeah. Um, Web3 is this term that no one's really properly defined. Ask 10 experts, quote unquote, you'll get 10 different answers, right? Um, blockchain is probably the most well-defined oh, term out of all of them. Right. Um, so I'll I'll use them interchangeably, but really blockchain is the is the is the base layer or the umbrella term to you to define all of them. Okay. So before we walk away from from what crypto oasis does, which I think that read really helped. Yeah. You'd mentioned um, uh, at the start of the show when we hadn't started that you are about to publish a report next yeah. week at the Dubai uh, Dubai FinTech Summit. Yes. Uh, this show is obviously going to air after the Dubai FinTech yeah. Summit. So. Would you mind sharing some, some actually, snippets? To. And we're very proud of this, right? So because we believe in this space being probably the most unique in the world. And okay. we started believing in this before we had the facts. We had a feeling. By now, we can prove it with facts. So um, this report has thought leadership pieces from from over 70 organizations um, to call out some of the traditional organizations. For example, we have State Street, which is one of the largest financial institutions in the world, writing with us. We have Citibank writing with us and providing insights. We have Circle, which is one of the behemoths and mammoths in the in the space of of uh, of, of digital currency. Um, and the list really goes on and on and on and on. And um, with that, we came up with 280 plus pages 
of this entire ecosystem, talking about companies that are here in the ecosystem. And with that, we're also publishing something called the Crypto Oasis Directory, which is an online directory available for our members, where you can find the companies that are active in this space, right? We've come out in this report with also, for example, chain analysis. Chain analysis has, uh, has been kind enough to provide us unique insights to prove that this is the most advanced region and the fastest growing region when it comes to crypto and blockchain in the world. Chain data suggests that the Middle East and North Africa region, the remit of crypto oasis, right, is the fastest growing in the world growing 1.5x from last year. And what is more surprising in all of this is that the UAE, although very steady from a regulatory and from a from a from a um, from a government perspective, is number 3 after Turkey and Lebanon in cryptocurrency usage, right? Because really 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 wasn't it Vietnam? Which is the I'm sure one? it was at some point. Okay. But right now it's Diagnosis. us. Okay. <laughs> it's the Middle East region and followed by Latam, by the way. Right. Right. Um, and 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 that's that's really rewarding, right? To be able to come out with a report like this in partnership with many of our great partners. So we also have the DLT Science Foundation there with us. Roland Berger is publishing this with us. And essentially being able to 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 show with data points that you know this isn't just us yapping about saying this is the most amazing ecosystem in the world. No, it is actually backed by data and facts. That's what okay, so I'm just going to I'm going to question something about not necessarily the report because as you said correctly the report is fact based and those are the best reports, right? They, they obviously a bit of opinion always adds a bit of flavor and spice to it, but it's yeah. data backed. Yeah. My question and 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 personally I think I'm very impressed with the progressive attitude uh you know uh, uh of the, the UAE, the UAE yeah. and arguably the wider region has taken. Yeah. But that's also been a function of the fact that some of the more traditional centers of commerce and economics have scorned yeah. you know, the whole crypto story a little bit, right? As you see them coming on board, right? And then, you know, the light bulb switching there and I can sort of see, I think EU passed yeah, uh, cri uh, crypto regulations or yeah. some form of crypto regulations uh, uh, recently. Does this part of the world continue to retain that, that attractiveness, which it's had historically to date? Right. So obviously, I'm pro the region. Let's start there. Well, yeah, but, but I'm going well, to but, try. But, yeah, we're, we're sitting in Dubai. We're having this conversation. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm going to try and be as, as factual as possible, okay. right? Because this morning, I read a headline, Rishi Shunak wants to turn the UK to the crypto capital of the world. Oh, is it true? Okay. I have, uh, it's, a, okay. it's a headline that, of, that, okay. I, that I scrolled through this morning. And um, it was uh, one of the senators, I think a Texan senator, that said he wanted to create the... The, the the crypto oasis over there and he okay. called it oasis right or he called it something oasis okay. texas oasis or whatever it is and i think anyone that is coming out with a headline like this has their head in the right space okay but what needs to be understood is that rome wasn't built in a day and the guys over here started close to 10 years ago yeah. right so, so they have the first mover advantage right. and but technology usually takes a lot of that first mover advantage away. sure but I think there's, when we talk about the crypto oasis and the UAE specifically, we say that there are three elements that are driving this. Okay. It's talent, capital, and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, dissect them. Infrastructure. Infrastructure is not just the amazing roads and the houses and, you know, the, the great restaurants and clubs and uh, that we go to and the great airport that we use, but it is also digital infrastructure and probably more importantly, regulatory infrastructure. Yeah. You don't build infrastructure in a day, right? The UAE has has been building these infrastructural elements pr to arrive where we are today. You could go as far as the 70s, probably, since the United Arab Emirates were announced, right? Then we talk about capital. Capital has always been in the UAE. It's an oil-rich country. It always wanted, it always has been one of the largest sovereign wealth funds around. But what's changed now is that capital has an affinity to stay here. 
That's one element that changed fr from the UAE capital. On top of this, with all of the uncertainty around the world, capital is moving to the UAE at a faster rate than ever before, right? And again, we can point at data points of hedge funds being set up here, millionaires moving over here that are not necessarily, you know, just simply going to leave, right? But what I believe is making the entire region probably the most unique is the talent element. Okay. Sitting in the UAE, let's start with, with talent. Um, so we operate between Switzerland and, and here. In Switzerland, to hire a Canadian citizen took us, I think, somewhere around six and a half, seven months, right? Over here, to hire someone from anywhere around the world, anywhere, um, a friendly or an unfriendly country, for all intents and purposes, takes you, what, a week to have them here? Sure. Yeah. So your talent pool is really the entire world. Geographically, you're sitting at the center of the world. But what probably is the, the one thing that I believe makes us really the most unique, and this is why if the US is coming out now and UK and you know Hong Kong is coming back right now, we have the youngest population by average in the world, this region. The World Economic Forum just came out with the Future of Jobs report again, suggesting that more than 50% of the workforce will need to be retrained. Massively. Yeah. Right? I already have the youngest population in the world. So easier to retrain. So oh, easier to train. To train, right? Yeah. So these are the workforce of the future. And that, I don't believe that this is just a, a fad that will fade. Okay. These are not elements so, that so will I'm gonna fade. So yeah. I'm going to come back with counters to all of that. Please. But 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 what I what I don't want to do is come across as being cynical. No, it's fair. just that I have a counter for that. I love the fact that you split it up into three aspects: infrastructure, capital, and talent. Talent. Yeah. All right. Now, here's my counter opinion, and please. and and by no means, please don't take this as me disagreeing with you. Yeah. But I do think that that with any sector which is at an early stage of development. Uh, you know, a few sobering uh, old folks like me are not a bad idea. I right? agree. Uh, well, thank you for calling me old. <laughs> right? You called yourself old. <laughs> I didn't have any any take in that. So, yeah. right. so here's my view. So I think infrastructure, I, I, I totally agree with you, right? Yeah. I think I think infrastructure is something which uh, is, is is getting built. And, and, I, I, and I mean infrastructure beyond just the roads and the houses. It's the underpinning technology infrastructure yeah, it's and if digital and regulatory. exactly and if the yeah. government is going to adopt it then i'm a big believer in public infrastructure and there's a whole other discussion yeah. which i have about how fintech which is the world i come from yeah. uh, which was built on the arbitrage of inefficiencies in public infrastructure now has to move on to adopting public infrastructure and working right. so that's one the other two in my humble opinion are very fickle in nature hmm. Capital switches faster than you can spell capital, mm -hmm. right? And talent is increasingly mobile. Just look at yourself, right? right. We were talking about right. you. You were, you know, you're you're Palestinian. Uh, you, I think, grew up in Germany. Born and raised. Uh, uh, you uh, are married to a, a, a young a young lady from from Saudi Arabia. Syria, Saudi Arabia. Uh, yeah. She's Syrian, Saudi Arabian. Uh, you live in the UAE. Uh, and and you travel quite extensively to right. different parts of not just the region. So, talent for me increasingly is a invisible. Yes, because they could live anywhere and operate anywhere. And I think we've seen more and more of that. Mm -hmm. And B, it sort of follows where you know wherever the water follows. So, I, I I'm. I'm I don't want to get into a, a debate because we'll we'll take up the time of the discussion. Right. <laughs> I, I personally think that that I do think the UAE definitely has the first mover advantage. Yeah. I think uh, it's done some very progressive things. The fact that government adoption was where it started itself provides you that necessarily, uh, uh, I guess, platform. Mm -hmm. You're correct about capital. I think it's attracting all the talent. Specifically, you know, I was reading an article a year or two ago that there's actually a flood light of talent coming out of India, for example, right. right? Because the environment there was not conducive for people to launching uh, uh, native businesses, if I may say so. Uh, my biggest point in all of this is to say that I think there's a fourth building block to this, yes. which is use cases beyond government, right? right? And are we seeing enough traction across 
traditional businesses, which mm-hmm. are all on this digital transformation journey because they all have to be. Right. And I'll go back to my sector of banking. And are they adopting all this good stuff? Mm-hmm. Or is the adoption between new sectors like gaming and new native players? Mm-hmm. Because I don't think that itself alone is going to be sufficient for this to become omnipresent, if I may t- use that term. Right. Now, allow me to retort okay. one by one, right? Infrastructure, I'm glad we agree on infrastructure, so let's leave that there. Capital, you're right. Capital is where the alpha is, generally speaking. Having said that, the UAE has defined itself as a safe haven for capital. Mm-hmm. And that, again, it wasn't built in a day, right? And people have exited. I'm just a normal dude for all intents and purposes, a guy, a professional working in this space. And you know what? I've always enjoyed a great network. But I can't count how many billionaires I suddenly meet. And there's obviously the Dubai you're obviously, billionaires. You're obviously, you're obviously <laughs> hanging out with the right kind of people, man. Are you on the Dubai Blink show or something? <laughs> I, I wouldn't be shot to do that. But yeah. Um, but no, there's the, the Dubai billionaire who, you know, obviously everyone in the Dubai is a billionaire. But no, there are these funds that are moved here that I can track that these are billion dollar funds that have moved over here. And they don't make decisions very quickly. To decide to move here took them a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And if they decide to move away from here, it'll take them a couple of years. But you know what? It's a fair point. If they don't find investment opportunities here, they won't necessarily be part of the ecosystem. They'll be based here. They'll be based here. Which, you know what, is good enough, which means that they're right there, at least geographically speaking, right? Talent... It's, it's, I mean, come on, the, the, the entire COVID thing changed the way we look at the world, particularly the way we look at work. But there's one thing that it changed and even magnified even more, quality of life. Mm-hmm. And this part of the world can give you very good quality of life. I agree with you. At a price, though. There you go. Yeah, at a price, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, and this is not something... Great, I'm glad the UK is joining. You know what? I'm glad the US is doing what they're doing because they're pushing people towards us, right? But I'm glad Hong Kong is back on the map. I'm glad we're talking that China is, you know, considering being more active again. But where's the quality of life? With respect to all of these places, but we live, I think anyone that's listening to this has visited probably Dubai in one time, or the quality of life that we live here, the safety and security that we have here. No one can just turn around and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to do this as well, right? This is a really long journey that right now we're slowly but surely reaching the pinnacle of, right? And God knows what's next. But what I can see is that the government, the senior leadership, their highnesses of of different emirates, they are actively talking about this and supporting this. Which other country in the world? Point four, use cases. Use cases. Now, or adoption, which is what I mean. I'm the guy that in 2015 said, within five years, everything will be on blockchain. And you know what? I was really convinced of it at the time. But even if you weren't, those are the kind of statements which one should make once in a while. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I really didn't just say that for good sound bites. I, I it's actually, one of, it's, it's, it's like it's like you know. I love one of the statements. Uh, a lady called Angela Strange, I think, uh, right. from Hor- uh, 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 Anderson Horowitz, made saying, uh, "Every company will be a fintech." Or something in the in the. All right. Yeah. yeah it's, it's great sound bites. But no, I, I really believe that. What I understood now is that the f- most important thing. Blockchain is not going to save the world. At some point, I was I was there, right? Because this entire notion of decentralization, owning your own data, owning your own assets, no middleman involved, value being transacted the way we transact with data um, and information, it really took me. I, I really and you know, but I had a I had a sobering wake up, um, which re- made me realize blockchain will never exist in isolation. It will always be part of a wider technology stack. It has certain use cases that are positive and great to use for some things you simply shouldn't use blockchain, right? So with that, use cases have emerged, especially here in the UAE, with private sector and public sector organizations, right? I can think of supermarket chains today that I can go to and track what we referred to earlier. I can think of the, um, and again, not to mention it too much, but back to the COVID crisis where vaccines and ventilators were tracked 
on 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 blockchain i can look at at financial institutions who are um who are enabling invoice discounting and invoice tracking through blockchain i can look at loyalty platforms that have moved on blockchain i can look at people and without but you know what no i want to call them out right security is a company in abu dhabi from Abu Dhabi, providing their services to the U.S. financial markets, right? Impressive. And by the way, this is not sponsored by security, yeah, but no, it's, no, it's it's so not, impressive. Actually, it's it's so impressive to see that you know we were always consumers here in the region. Mm -hmm. For the first time, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing that we are leading the charge. Come on, a company out of ADGM offering services to the financial markets in the U.S. Impressive. Impressive. Companies here out of the UAE, a company like uh, Verifax, for example, right, um, that is providing solutions for governments from all around the world. It, and I can name 30 companies just from the top of my head, but I don't want to, to have this look too pitchy. But, but the matter of the fact is companies out of here, and, and one use case too, EX Sports, right, they enable sportsmen right and the, not the kind of sport not the cristiano ronaldo the messi kind of sportsman but think about a muay thai fighter that doesn't have money to protect his hand to buy gloves through nfts suddenly this muay thai fighter is enabled and you know what i watched him online sometime i want to help him rather than donating to his cause i buy his nft i support him right and these are the use cases and there's use cases for social good there's use cases now you know the entire cop 28 agenda there's use cases about tracking this entire carbon credit uh, system using blockchain but again you're talking to someone that has uh, signed his name in blood next to this no this is fine so I, I what you've done for me is to say that there is there it is good work going on here that work is being utilized locally uh, I do still think that the, the, the traditional ecosystem here has to come a long way in terms of adopting, but it's good to see that these people are being able to demonstrate their the capabilities overseas, which in effect should work to convince the people locally to it, right? right. I think there is generally a friction to shift yeah. that I have seen. You know, I've worked in industry here uh, and also consulting. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of seen both sides of the story. One as an advisor telling them, hey, you should consider these new technologies. But on the other side, I've seen the, the sort of pushback on that. Let's let's shift topics because uh, uh, I think I, I, want to, I, I want to get something else out of you. Sure. Uh, UAE is obviously a federation of Emirates, yes. right? And and we have multiple regulatory, quasi-regulatory bodies who are coming up with their version of regulating different aspects of the, call it the wider Web3 or digital asset or crypto space, right? Can you help all of us just understand how does all of this come together as it stands today? Right. Um, and I think, thank you for asking that question because I think it's 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 one that many people oversimplify. The UAE is a complex legal landscape, mm -hmm. right? Given that it's a trade hub, they try to create a free zone that fits or economic zone that fits everyone, right? But let's um, and and that that really is is one of the these infrastructure elements that the UAE has tapped into, right? So, the, but you have more than forty different economic zones over here. Okay. Today, the one with with most number of crypto companies by first mover advantage is the DMCC, right? Which is quite a surprise to a lot of people, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. A lot of people don't know that. Yes. It's well, uh, it's it's you know again when we looked at it, it's there's there's such a gravitation towards that space. Okay. But let's zoom out, right? The UAE, seven Emirates, as such, federal laws, local laws, or state laws for all intents and purposes, right? more than 40 different economic zones but on a really high level there's three types of economic zones that you think of when you think of the uae there's mainland and that could be mainland abu dhabi mainland dubai mainland Sharjah, mainland ras al khema mainland Umm al gawain you name it right um and those follow the local laws those follow um, local ownership laws, they have sometimes different commercial laws, there's special free zones that have specific laws for use cases, that's one, 
right? There generally, um, even if you have 100% ownership, there will be some way or form where some local representation is required, right? And also there, uh, your tax regime is different, your, um, your, your employee regime is different, and so forth. So that's mainland. Then you have free zones, right? And those you have you have free zones like the DMCC, for example, the Dubai Multi Commodities Center. You have uh, free zones like uh, like the Dubai Silicon Oasis, um, Commerce City, uh, Abu Dhabi Airport Free Zone. Um, it, the list goes on Go and on. Ahead. With these free zones, like for example, today now also Ras Al Khaimah is actively entering into the space. Sharjah is entering into the space. They, these are free zones. These free zones offer a different tax regime, offer a different employee structure. Many cases have specific regulations for specific use cases in these free zones, mm-hmm. right? So the Dubai. Um, the Dubai Multi Commodity Center was at the time the reason they had this first mover advantage, the first one to allow this license that's called distributed ledger technology, right? And proprietary trading. Now, mainland and free zones are governed by something called ESCA, right? The Emirates Security Exchange Authority. Yep. Right? And they're the ones who 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 define what these places are allowed to do, what these places aren't allowed to do. Now, the third the third type of economic zone that you have here in the UAE is these special economic zones. The special economic zones, you think of uh, ADGM and DIFC, right? And those are zones where the laws of the UAE commercially don't apply, right? Special economic zones where if I have a dispute with someone in DIFC, the Dubai courts won't help me. They'll tell me go to the DIFC court, similarly in ADGM. Right, And this is super smart, and again, back to this vision of the UAE, because they said there's a lot of companies over here from around the world that want to move here but do not understand our legal landscape. We don't want to put the hurdle of entry so high. So you know what? We put it down. We apply the most practiced law in the world, English common law, and an abbreviation of it, right? And everyone from all around the world can come and understand and, you know, use their in-house counsel to understand what's going on. Now, that's clear. Mainland, free zone, special economic zones. Um, Mainland and free zone are governed by the Emirates Security Exchange Committee. Uh, DIFC has the DFSA and uh, and IDGM has the FSRA for as as regulators. Right now, uh, I think it was in, uh, in in the beginning of last year we saw the announcement of the Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority. The mm-hmm. Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority, an initiative by His Highness, a decree by His Highness to create this this authority at the time, which became, I think, the first purpose built regulatory authority of its kind but focused on dubai or focused on dubai mainland and free zone okay that's very important the ifc is not in their remit and nor is adgm nor is adgm okay again vara is very specific for dubai to prove the use case in dubai and then maybe uh, share the and how do they tie up with the securities commission right so You'd have to ask someone from VARA for the details. Okay. But for all intents and purposes, they are an enabler of these laws that are already defined and are supporting with the definition of new laws. Okay. Right? So they, they are governed by them, actively working with them. right? Um, but essentially, VARA has a more detailed run. ESCA is looking at everything that is securities, everything that is finances, anything that is um, uh, 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 insurances, anything that is in that, that industry. right? VARA in, the U, in Dubai specifically goes specific for Dubai companies, mainland and free zone, not the DIFC. Right, and then you have uh, the emergence of now other areas that are starting to do that, like for example, Ras Al Khaimah Digital Asset Ortho- uh, Oasis, right, Oasis. Rakdao, yeah. right, which also said, hey, you know what, we're going to create a regulator, a special free zone. So it's it's a very interesting landscape um, that is often simplified. The decision of where to set up and how and with whom <laughs> is one that could impact majorly what you do in business. I don't know if that if the word quagmire sort of hits me out on this <laughs> side, right? So so, uh, so I see two sides to the story here too, right? So one is, in effect, we are creating quasi-sandboxes, right, uh, right which accelerate the growth. Yeah. Um, uh, but at the same time, there has to come a time 
in the foreseeable future where there's got to be some level of alignment, right? Otherwise, I'm assuming you have multi-jurisdiction. Why not? Think of, think of, let's move away from this world of crypto and blockchain. Yeah. In the normal business world, by the way, all of these will still exist. No, no, I do, but I, I have the right. same issue with fintech, yeah. to be yeah. honest with you, yeah. right? I said, so you have the central bank sitting at the top. Yeah. You have entities regulated by the DFSA. Yeah. You have entities regulated under the ADGM. Yeah. And they're actually operating onshore. Yeah. Right. And I'm assuming if the central bank then decides to regulate a particular sector, then the central bank law overrules what might come out of DFSA right. or the ADGM. And this is just a hypothesis I'm making. Yeah. But my question is that if you built a business on the back of a certain set of regulation yeah. for five to seven years down the line, if the central bank then comes and comes with something which is divergent, it actually could be quite challenging for businesses. And and it's a fair point, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't I think don't we're going believe... to solve it here. I think... I think we just I need to recognize that that exists. It, it, yes, but also at the same time, we need to recognize that the UAE has, again, for the first time in, 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 in a while, taken a leadership role in this space. Now the UAE is recognized as one of the top three, top four destinations from a regulatory point of view. Is it perfect? Of course not, right? But are they taking all of the right steps to go there? Yes. Definitely. Yeah. I, I, I don't doubt that. Yeah. Right. Going to switch to a slightly more interesting topic, and I, I and I know what the answer is going to be, right? Every friend I had who was a Web three expert three months <laughs> ago is now an AI expert, <laughs> right? Right, and more specifically, a generative AI, and more specifically, a chat right. GPT expert, of course. right? Um, I personally don't think it's an either or. I personally think that there is. Uh, 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 very interesting point of intersection yeah. which 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 comes around but i want to hear sort of your view in terms of why we're seeing this sudden shift in the way people are positioning themselves yeah. i don't see the need to but people have chosen to uh, and 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 where do you see those points of intersection so first of all i don't think anyone is a blockchain expert Let's start there. When people try and introduce me as one, I reject that notion. Well, even better. I have people right. say they're Web3 experts. Well, yeah, even worse. <laughs> Sorry. And, and Metaverse uh, experts. Oh, I, and go, I don't know what. Yeah. We're, we're going to skip Metaverse. Yeah. That was season one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Um, I don't think that anyone has real, hard, unrefutable knowledge in this space. It's not yeah. like, hey, you understand the heart There's no or you monopoly. don't understand There's the There's no heart. intellectual monopoly on no, the topic. No, not yet. at all. Yeah, I not agree at all. with you. Right. AI though, AI has been been out there since the fifties. Yeah, you know, 70s. We've had robotics, we've had machine learning, yeah. we've had you know data sciences. Yeah. So artificial intelligence, really. So let's start with with crypto, crypto blockchain. Even if you've been working in this space for let's say since its inception, you're no expert in it. Because you know what? The next layer one is going to come out. The next upgrade to Ethereum is going to come out, and whatever you know becomes obsolete, and you need to really, really learn it again, right? AI is very different. AI, I think, I, so I've, I've had the pleasure of sitting with leading AI experts and, and again, also at the time, working towards strategies of governments for artificial intelligence. Um, one of the key learnings in blockchain was that blockchain will never exist in isolation. So think of blockchain as the transactional layer, right? And that's what it should be used at, right? Mm -hmm. um, smart contracts, transactions, totally. tracking value. But... When you want to start developing insights, when you want to start manipulating data, you should not necessarily do this on blockchain, right? There's use cases where this makes sense. Let's say you're dealing with um, with financial data. You want the entire steps of the process to be tracked. Yes, you could do this on blockchain. But AI is a, is a natural element that will pull from blockchains, right, and start suggesting elements that, you know, I could see a world even where artificial intelligence starts writing smart contracts for us, mm -hmm. right? We define the use cases, the artificial intelligence defines the smart contract, and suddenly the entire access to blockchain is 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 solved and we've solved the talent issue as well. So yeah. So you 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 see it and I agree with you that AI sort of sits on top or sits alongside blockchain. Architecturally it would be probably on top, but you know, let's not say on top or but it pulls from blockchain. I think in a in a perfect world, this entire um 
landscape of emerging technologies will exist in a concerted effort. Think of your blockchain, Think, let's say, your self-driving car, which is an IoT device, is um, governed by some form of artificial intelligence, some form of automation, is connected from a value point of view every time you pass Salic to your blockchain wallet, and, and so goes the story. I think it's a concerted effort of, of, or it's a concert of emerging technologies in the future. Right. So, so my call to action to all my friends who have switched their names from being blockchain experts to AI experts is to go back being blockchain experts. <laughs> right? Yeah, you're better off being a blockchain <laughs> yeah, expert. Yeah, because there are right. enough AI experts yeah, out yeah. there who've been doing this yeah, for because long Because AI, enough, there's right? people with PhDs in AI that go back to the 80s. Yeah, right? so, I, I yeah. agree with you. But, but I do find it quite interesting. I've, I've seen quite a lot, lot of people switch actually even their company uh, taglines and stuff like that. Uh, switching gears or yeah. switching areas. Let's talk a little bit about the crypto world, right? And and I'll oversimplify it because uh, uh, I think for the sake of understanding, CBDCs, stable coins, right. altcoins, and altcoins could be, I don't know, thousands of them. Yeah. You'll give me a number uh, if you have one. I think somewhere around above 20,000. Yeah, some yeah. some crazy number, right? Uh, you and I can build one now on the back <laughs> right of the Right now, yeah. On we'll the back of the show. Couch and Omic coin. Exactly, there you go. <laughs> That's the one I want to launch. Uh, so... CBDCs, uh, you know, there's enough collateral out there, both on wholesale and retail. And and uh, as we were discussing before yeah. before yeah. the start of the show, wholesale CBDCs came in play about four to five years ago. Yeah. There are use cases yeah. that are being used. And I think more and more of that adoption will grow, yeah. right? Uh, retail CBDCs, I think, I don't know, 100 plus countries are, are experimenting with yeah. it. Some of them are on blockchain, not all of them are. are uh, correct me True. if yeah, I'm not no, wrong. No, fair. China's yeah. actually on a database sort of based. Uh, they, they they say it's a blockchain, but, you know, it's a, it's it, the argument can be made anything that's centralized doesn't really need to be blockchain. Right. So my question is, what's your take on CBDCs, specifically retail CBDCs going forward? Right. I think it's one of those that that has taken a lot of attention of people most recently, right? Because you know, this this these doomsday um, people have come around and said, you know, everything's going to be controlled and governments is going to take back. CBDCs are one of the first enterprise use cases that we spoke about mm -hmm. way back when, right? Um, because that's the first time that you could essentially move value through a network through block Bitcoin at the time. You could move value throughout a network at at a very low cost and low friction right so obviously central banks or banks that spend hundreds of millions on their infrastructure were the first to take note and say hey how can we use this to ourselves as early back as don't hold me to the year but it must have been somewhere around 16 or 17 yeah about five years ago, um, five, yeah. Six years ago banco yeah. santander um with their operation in the uk and with their operation in 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 spain in partnership with the central bank of uh, of the uk essentially came out with a way that they could move value from uh, spain to the uk right and and there's there's immense value in this so let's let's at one point so stable coins are essentially just backed by value I think stable coins will be as much of a thing as we have different currencies. We'll live in a world where there's probably hundreds of different stable coins, right? Um, and and already, I think I don't know the exact number, but you know, it feels like there's hundreds already, right? No, but, but do you really think there'll be hundreds? Because there are all kinds of stable. Why coins, not? Right? And how stable are they? Well, like, okay, sure. From from that angle, yes, uh, they should be. From a business angle, from a regulatory angle, from a technology angle, sound. Right. Yeah. Let's not talk about the the lunas of the world. Or yeah, so know, I'm I'm comfortable with fiat based uh, stable coins, which are yeah. dollars and stuff. I'm even comfortable with certain commodity based stable yeah. coins, whether gold that's backed, gold stable coin, or silver back, or yeah. silver back. Yeah. I, you know, even coffee back would work for me. Sure. Uh, uh, this, but but then there are all kinds of algorithmic uh, stable coins, which, to be honest with you, even the well, you know, they go right over my head. Uh, and that's the thing, right? And and until they don't, they're a risk. And, and we and I don't see wide adoption beyond people just speculatively buying these stable coins because they believe that there's appreciation of value. Right. So stable coins are generally not the coins that people buy for appreciation of value. 
Traders buy stable coins for arbitrage, right? Because you buy it for sure 99 enough. cents, you sell it for a dollar, you buy it at 99 point5, you sell it at 99 point6, right? There's constant there's constant arbitrage and this is how many of these stable coins are are governed, right? So so you know what? let me let me not argue that point. It, it could be that we'll have one to rule them all, but it could be that you know Emirates says, hey, I have my stable coin and um, but why would they know, have a stable coin? Why wouldn't they just have a CBDC? CBDC, just to to understand the term, is a central bank digital, digital currency. currency. It's just it's it's programmable fiat. It's programmable fiat issued by a central, central bank. Central bank, yes. right? So the central bank will not come to, uh, assuming, right? I'm, I'm making this up. Will not come to Emirates and tell them, hey, you can use this currency as as you like it and engage, you know, let's say, miles and more uh, skywards into this. Ah, okay. So Think about oh, Emirates, Emirates saying airline. Sorry, I took Emirates as the. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's my yeah. bad. Yeah. Okay. So, but All Emirates. Right. Yeah. So, so you're saying you might have a number of stable coins which sit within, yeah. and in uh, as long as there's a certain amount yeah. of interoperability which can be. Exactly. Achieved, and by right? the way, from a loyalty point of view, we're already there. Yeah, we are. Right. Uh, uh, you Starbucks use your, is doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, you yeah. use your your tokens that you've or your your benefits that you've gathered somewhere, and you sell uh, you sell them and use them somewhere else. So so doesn't need to be an environment where there's one to rule them all. So stable tokens, uh, algorithmic stable coins, I'd love to say that I understand them enough. I know that DAI is out there and has been running for, for a long time. I know that at some point USDT, Tether said that they're 100% backed uh, by, by uh, 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 deposits. And then recently we found out that they're not, not. right? Um, I well, know that if, even if they are, if there's a run at the deposits, then at least for a for yeah. a certain period of time, you introduce a lot of volatility. Right? Yeah, and 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 we've seen it deep peg. Um, most recently, when Silicon Valley Bank went down, we saw Circle, Circle being yep. deep pegged. But yeah, see, Circle is is one I I really I really rate because you know they're going the fully transparent, fully regulated, fully governed route, right? There's little question marks around it, right? And there's there's others that are around. So where does this leave the old coins then? One by one. <laughs> Let's <laughs> so these are stable coins. Put those stable coins aside. Two types of stable coins, algorithmic stable coin, value backed stable coin. Value can be fiat backed, can be commodities backed, right? Okay. Then you have the central bank digital currencies. The central bank digital currencies have been around forever. No one, uh, uh, I don't think anyone will be able to stop even if they yeah, wanted the to. Yeah, on the wholesale side, none. It's but I, I think on the retail side either. I think you will, you know, governments want to control the flow of money. Already the majority of our transactions are electronic, hmm. right? Um, and And when you get locked out of your bank account today, you can't do anything anyway. So this entire notion that a government will have even more control over me, you know what? Yes, it's even more control. We are already part of a system that has controls over me. If I am part of the banking system and the bank tomorrow decides to freeze my account, I can't do anything, right? So a stable a stable coin in this, and a central bank digital currency in this sense, I don't see much of a difference to that and let's say that I'm in a dollar, which is why I believe that, not only I believe, uh, you can look at more than 120 com countries right now who are working towards this. Now, moving to crypto, um, and again, I'm not a Bitcoin maxi, but the longer I am in the space, the more I realize how special Bitcoin is, right? Because it's the only one that's running completely independently. It's the only one that doesn't have an organization assigned to and it. And you buy it's into the only one. You buy into the 21 million coins. Well, yeah, it is 21 million. Code is law. It can't be changed. Right. No one can change that. Okay. You can create a new one, where it's now 210 million or 2 billion, right? But Bitcoin will forever be 21 million. Right. right, and with that, it is, it is a, the most unique one, right, out of them. Then, in the old way of thinking of it, everything else is altcoins. Altcoins, you know what? If you're listening to this podcast and you don't have any exposure into crypto, please don't go buy altcoins. Right, get some Bitcoin in your wallet, get some Ethereum in your wallet. Right, and I know they're probably more expensive, and you know you could be a trillionaire if you buy this, this this weird <laughs> token that has some meme against it. But if you're looking at this as a long-term investment, it's it's Bitcoin 
and Bitcoin only, and you know, you could make an argument for it. Yeah, theory. so we don't want to give any investment advice. And, 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 no, and this is no investment yeah, yeah. advice. So, no. so we don't. So, 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 this so is, where's the notion of crypto outside CBDCs to an extent, stable coins, and consumer payments? If we look at Tether, for example, yeah. Tether already clears more transactions in volume than Visa and MasterCard put together. Yep. Right? Um, with that, you know, there's this entire notion about Bitcoin using a lot of energy, um, being being so bad for the environment, which, by the way, has been debunked. Um, but the banking system, and you know this probably better than me, uses up a lot of power, a lot of data, a lot of uh, uh, money, out of this entire world. I can see a world where slowly but surely we will move towards a more decentralized centralized architecture, right? I don't think, just in the same way we think of the internet. Today, you have the internet that is open and public to everyone, but in your company, you have an intranet, and in my company, I have an intranet, right? So I do believe that there will be this hybrid approach. Which is what we're seeing already. So there's exactly. some level of centralization. I still can't get my head around the fact that people will use Bitcoins to buy cups of coffee. Me um, neither, you know what? I don't think this is the whole idea of it. You know, you and me are part of this this, this group we have, uh, yeah. uh, 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 which which is called the FinTech Tuesdays, uh, right. which I, right. I, 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 with a few other people, mistakenly created. It's now become a beast <laughs> of its own. It has become and, a and, beast. And, 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 and there was a very interesting discussion going on regarding, you know, why are more people not using uh, Bitcoins or, or, sorry, cryptocurrencies to buy and spend money on, on, on daily needs? And my argument was... Yeah, when you know when the Bitcoin was dipping, that's fine. Everybody's happy to buy cups of coffee, but when yeah. Bitcoin goes from sixteen thousand to thirty thousand and whatever a couple of months, I don't see too many people buying cups of coffee with yeah. it. Yeah, right. I, so that volatility sort of works against the whole concept of it being used as a as plus. A the Bitcoin currency. network, as it stands today, without Lightning, isn't made to handle these kind of transactions. These okay. micro transactions. You need something like the Lightning network to come up and be uh, be used around the world to have this. I think Bitcoin will remain as a store of value. And again, thank you for pointing it out. It's no investment advice, but it will st remain a store, store of value. Of value yeah. And you'll have other currencies um, built on top of it that we will use in our daily transactional needs. I believe that I'm less than 10 years away from starting to pay everything in a in a crypto ba or a crypto enabled uh, digital dirham, right? Um, because it just makes sense to do that. So, so let's 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 talk about uh, a topic: tokenization. Sure. Right? Uh, I, I personally, I'm a big, big fan of tokenization. I personally yeah. think it it adds so many benefits yeah. into uh, the traditional world, right? Yeah. Let, let's take real estate for example, right? It, it makes assets more investable, yeah. makes it more transparent. You can fractionalize ownership. There's greater liquidity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Uh, what's your take on? On, on how tokenization is going to get adopted and how rapidly are you going to see tokenization getting adopted in the so-called non-digital world? So tokenization is a trillions of dollar opportunity, yeah. right? So people have called it $11 trillion, have called it $3 trillion, regardless. Let's, let's dissect it, let's understand it, and because I think anyone that understands it will see it's a huge opportunity, right? Think of your house today. What can you do with your house? You can live with it, you can own it, you can mortgage it. Right, but the process of mortgaging it is is complex. Um, it creates a more debt. But imagine that you could tap into the value of any asset that you own in a way that you can take parts of it and pay for something else with that. Right, creating asset interoperability and and creating essentially a, a way that this entire asset these liquid uh, these these hard assets that are very difficult to move very difficult to liquidate suddenly become liquid right and that is such a huge and tremendous opportunity which is why we're we're very happy that you know as part of the group of companies that we're that we are part of um, we've issued the first uh, security token offering out of Switzerland the first governed security token offering it's a project called Finca token where we took a a, um, a cattle farm in Bolivia and you are able to buy into the cattle farm right and again 
ha- have I ever considered being an owner of a cattle farm? Uh, funny enough, I have, but um, it, but you know, to the normal public, maybe this isn't something. But suddenly, I can tap into that benefit. These entire areas of, of of business that were previously closed off to to large capital holders are suddenly now open to everyone right and i i do believe that in the future we'll live in a world where i'll have complete asset fluency but uh, asset uh, asset fluency between between one and 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 other assets i get that and I, and again i believe you do i think anyone who gets tokenization um uh well i think there's uh, but there's 11 trillion 3 trillion the amount is big i think the opportunity is huge uh i'm conscious of time yeah. i i think we 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 i've taken too much of your time uh, thank you for having me I'm we're just... back in 1996 now yes right and is this the 1996 moment for blockchain so I, I i really believe so i believe that it's 1996 and and blockchain is the internet and again i started saying that before i even had the facts to prove it because i believed in it by now when you look there's a chart that that you know you can google where you look at internet adoption versus crypto adoption you can see that it's moving in the same way in numbers of users why do we say that i i actually remember 1996 right and i remember how people thought that having a personal computer is is something for you know for for people with too much money Right, where hey, why do you have a person, and and why are you getting a mo a DSL modem? You know, dial up is fine, right? But it's it's with these technological advancements and with more people being connected that the benefit is unlocked. I don't think that I've, I can imagine maybe just ten percent of how our world will look like once it's completely governed from a value point of view by blockchain. Okay, so we're right? scratching the surface. And we're still early. Okay, you know so, what? So if I give you three genie wishes right now in terms of what could help us drive greater blockchain adoption in the corporate world. In the corporate world? Right. Okay. What would those be? I once don't want to say regulation first, but that's the first one that, that came to mind. So, education. So education. regulation... Which means it... No, I will not say regulation. Oh, you will not say it. (laughs) Done. Okay. I'll say education, education, education. Right? When you understand something, you're willing to interact with it. When you don't, you're you're generally going to be of the point of view maybe later. Then how do you... You know, culturally, we humans are sort of subject to not preferring change. Yeah. Right? And education is usually only imbibed when we are open. Yes. Minded. So how are you going to fix that? I think uh, humanity will will need to accept that it's a very different world right now, right? And and technology is a, is a major enabler of this. Not crypto, right. just crypto. I mean, think of chat GPT, think of all of these, think of social media, think of YouTube, how they change the, the facet of society, yeah. right? And, and, and with that, you know, you, you asked me for a genie wish. So my genie wish that is, is that genie. people should, that should. people get educated, right? And 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 I'm completely self-educated in this, by the way, right? The the knowledge is out there. It's in 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 structures. Right? Oxford has its. Oh, Oxford, it's in droves. It's, it's in droves. It's all there, and yeah. it's free, by the way. If if you're looking at a program and you're looking to spend five to ten thousand dollars on it, please don't. Right? There's programs out there that would cost you fifty dollars and a hundred dollars that will educate you in the space. So that's one. The second one. And again, it's a genie wish. It's for the legacy infrastructure to disappear, right? Uh, but again, you asked me for a genie wish, right? Legacy infrastructure is probably one of the um, most uh, biggest factors that is pulling us back, right? And last but not least, it is regulation. Because corporates, maybe the, the public will start adopting it. Corporates, large organizations will not come into the space strong. And by the way, everyone is geared up for it, right? I can't think of a of a of a large multinational of sorts that doesn't have a blockchain or crypto agenda. I can't think of a financial institution that doesn't have a blockchain or crypto agenda. But they won't move until they feel safe. And you know what? Rightfully so. Right? So education, I, I agree with you. legacy infrastructure and uh, and and regulation. We just need to find the the, the genie lamp now. I'll, I'll so, go look for it. Now. Yeah, uh, right. Sorry. No, but sucker, thanks for coming. 
Thank you keep doing me. the good work you're doing with Crypto Oasis. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it, it is, uh, 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 well, I, I'll try and spend as much time as I can uh, in the whole Crypto Oasis Please ecosystem. Do. And if I can help in any way, I will be more than happy to. Although I'm a we'll novice. We'll need you. I'll, no, I'll, we'll I'll, need I'll, you. I'll be a novice. Uh, uh, you guys are also quite an inspiration in terms of what we are trying to replicate in this sort of the, 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 the FinTech Tuesdays world. Uh, I think so. Apologies if you're going to beg and borrow and plagiarize some of your ideas. Oh, it's, it's only right. welcome. Um, uh, but, but you know, well done. Keep the good Thank work you. going. Um, um, uh, and I, I guess your, uh, your energy is palpable. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. And thank you for listening. If you've listened to the entire episode, then I appreciate it. And, and thank you for having me. Well, I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. It was, it was, it was uh, educational to say the very least. Thank you. Very and much. we still had half a dozen topics we couldn't <laughs> cover. <laughs> but anyways, guys, thanks a lot for joining in today. Uh, that was Sucker. He is the uh, co-founder of Crypto Oasis. If you do not know about Crypto Oasis, Google them. Um, um, they, uh, uh, it's, it's very self-explanatory. I myself Googled, uh, become a member, uh, if you would like to, um, I think it is, uh, one of the most vibrant communities that we have, uh, in the UAE or the wider region, depending on where you're hearing from. Uh, and, and I'm sure there'll be more conversations that, uh, the both of us will have maybe sure. in different forums. Uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you to Sucker and goodbye to you all. 